Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another environmental science screencast with your teacher, Mr. Stano. And today we're going to look at sustaining aquatic biodiversity. When we last left off, we were talking about all the different biomes, terrestrial and aquatic included, and now we're going to look a little bit more deeply into aquatic biodiversity within that, in those biomes. If we take a little trip to Lake Victoria, we've noticed that there's been a decline in their endemic fish populations. Those endemic fish populations are populations of fish that are, were natural into that area. The Nile perch was introduced into the lake and we saw a number of other situations arise from it. So the introduction of the Nile perch uh, basically outcompeted the endemic fish there. They also experienced algae blooms within that area from nutrient runoff from near the nearby cities and surroundings. There was also an invasion of the water hyacinth that has blocked sunlight and deprived those waters of oxygen um, and the productivity underneath. And then the Nile perch is in decline because it has eaten its own food supply. So basically it has eaten and uh, used up so much of the biomass in the lake that it can no longer sustain itself. So it's this is a, a pretty big effect when we introduce a species into an area and all the other uh, secondary effects that happen because of its introduction. As far as aquatic biodiversity, and we've alluded to this uh, before in classes, that we don't really know much about those systems, uh, especially our marine systems, the depth at which they go, and just the, the abundance of interconnectedness between the species and the environment itself is vast, and we're only touching the surface with a lot of this. We do know a couple of things, though, that biodiversity is, uh, tends to be higher near the coast, where there's uh, usually more habitat and nutrients around to support the productivity. And um, so there are some basic things that we learned with the biomes that, you know, definitely in the top uh, portions of the oceans and you know, some of those pelagic regions that are going to be more productive than as we go deeper down. So we're, we have some basic understandings. Um, but like I said, it's a little bit tough to get a whole grasp of the system. We do know that as a whole, economic services that are provided by our marine systems is huge along with the ecological importance of them. Uh, pretty much humans are kind of to blame for this. We've uh, destroyed a number of the habitat there and disrupted or degraded a large proportion of the world's coastal systems. We see it here on Long Island, marine and freshwater ecosystems with the buildup, a lot of, of a lot of developments and tourism around certain spots it really, really destroys the habitat for a number of coastal species. Approximately 20% of the world's coral reefs has been destroyed. Uh, and this could be due to any number of things such as uh, rise in sea level temperatures, uh, just destruction through tourism, ocean liners, uh, any number of things. Um, but we've also seen during the past 100 years, sea levels have risen which is intruded, intruded upon some of those organisms that live on the coast, like our lovely piping plover. Uh, so that one has also been affected with a number of other bird species. Uh, we've also destroyed more than one third of the world's mangrove forest for shipping lanes as we get into and out of certain areas. Um, this is looking at a before and after picture of um, a trawler net that basically gets dropped to the bottom. And we talked about this uh, uh, briefly uh, with looking at the documentary, The End of the Line. So basically these trawler nets, they kind of scoop up, they act as a plow on the bottom and scoop up everything into it. And this is what it leaves behind. Uh, pretty much nothing. So these trawler nets can range in size from being, you know, moderately, uh, you know, a few feet, tens of feet, all the way up to the, you know, you can fit airplanes into these things. So just the size depends on the area and this, the shipping fleet that's uh, employing that net. Uh, invasive species are definitely increasing in our marine and freshwater biodiversity. There's a number that you've uh, studied in class, uh, such as the water flea or even, you know, uh, such things classic like the zebra mussel, a number of species that have been introduced. These are basically going to be blamed for about two thirds of the fish extinctions that happened in the U.S. within the last century or two. And uh, almost so half of the world's people live on or near coastal zones. And 80% of the of ocean water pollution comes from land-based human activities. Sewage treatment plant dumping in nitrates and phosphates. Even the use of fertilizers will run off into the ocean. Certain detergents, which are now outlawed in certain areas, are um, also responsible for putting nitrates and phosphates into the water. So we really have to be careful with what's going into that water supply from a number of different activities that uh, humans do on these coastal regions. 
population growth is also another uh, relatively big thing as people are our biggest cities are located along the coasts. And as we pack those in more and more pollution from that po those populations uh, can definitely get into our beaches. And we can see here this plastic wrapped around uh, this poor seal here. So there's definitely uh, this sea lion. So there's definitely some issues that we see and a number of others will be brought up in class. Overfishing, uh, I would say maybe the biggest threat or one of the biggest threats. Uh, we've fished or overused or overexploited our marine fisheries um, to the point where they expect by 2050, they'll be uh, pretty much uh, near extinction for most of our fisheries. Our big fish, our top predatory fish, are becoming quite scarce. Uh, smaller fish are, uh, definitely would become next as those big fish are not there. People have to find a substitute. And uh, we throw away about 30% of the fish we catch, also known as that bycatch. So we have to be careful with that bycatch. And also in the course of the fishing, we need to kill sea mammals and birds that just happen to be get trapped in our nets, long lines, any number of other... Uh, fishing devices that we use. These are some of those fishing devices that I've mentioned. Uh, the use of spotter airplanes in a lot of areas has also been um, outlawed in use because it allows for basically that a real ease and uh, that view from up above to find schooling fish. Um, the per seine fishing we see, it's a very common method it's used uh, all over the world. Drift net uh, uh, fishing with the float buoys, also used. All these are used anywhere from off the coast of Long Island, east coast of the United States, all around the world. It's just that the size of these fleets that go out are just are becoming so huge that they can just take their really their big fair advantage or unfair advantage of fish out there. Uh, and so we can see a number of things really going after our aquatic biodiversity. Uh, but it is, it's one of these problems that is going to be very hard to, to control. Humans, we're along the coastline, and our impacts are, just get worse and worse as time goes on. And also, we don't necessarily see what is happening right away. And people are unaware of what's actually happening. And the fact that those oceans, as we go off the coastline a little bit, start now to run into other areas, or people start believing that it's also part of their of their areas or their right to be fishing in those areas, we have it just makes for a very slow process to uh, conduct any legislation, especially on an international level, to help protect these uh, these species. So human ecological footprint has definitely been expanding, and like I said before, we just don't really see what's going on. And some people just have a different view of the ocean. Some people have no problem going out there, keeping uh, more than their fair share or keeping fish of not the correct size limits that's been set up by legislation. It's, the, it's a very hard thing to for local governments, federal governments to protect and oversee these different uh, legislation that's put out. So we can do some things that I've mentioned to it. When we talked about tragedy of the commons early in the year, we all mentioned that Laws and legislation set up between groups of people to manage their resource is probably the best way. So that's exactly what has been done. We've had organizations such as the IWC, the International Whaling Commission, um, of course, you know, our Endangered Species Act, and a number of other legislation uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service and Marine um, uh, National Marine Fisheries that will help us. But since 1989, the U.S. government has required offshore shrimp trawlers to use turtle exclusion devices. So that's one example right there. Uh, people love seeing these sea turtles, and it brings in a huge amount of tourism, more money than the loss of them. So looking more into those sea turtles, six of the world's major uh, seven major turtles populations are either threatened, endangered because of human activities, such as those trawling nets uh, and number, another other fishing devices. If we take a look at the manatee, um, manatees is great. They eat the, feed along those seagrass beds that we uh, mentioned a little bit earlier on in the year, but they are also uh, highly affected and uh, very susceptible to human activity. Habitat loss is one of the biggest th uh, threats. Entanglement of fishing lines, this is a slower moving organism. They do scare a little bit uh, easily, but they have the ability to get tangled up. High speed to hit by boats, usually their areas are pretty protected. They're okay from that. Stress from cold has been known to be an issue. Low reproductive rate, 
but also algae blooms. In Florida last year, there was a number of instances where algae blooms uh, ended up producing toxins that would adhere to the seagrass, the manatee would eat them, and these red tides and these algae blooms producing these toxins would end up killing a huge amount of manatees. Uh, and those algae blooms are due to those nutrients being released into the water around them. So that's uh, probably the biggest threat here in the United States, especially Florida, is those algae balloons releasing toxins. Commercial whaling is another, uh, another scar on human history with some successes, though. We've known that a lot of the whales have been over over time uh, to the point where commercial whaling has been banned in 1960. But... Uh, the ban, the International Whaling Commission, uh, there are some ways around getting these fish, such as uh, capturing these uh, mammals, sorry, these whales for research purposes or a number of other things. Also uh, included with this are the small cetaceans or dolphins that are kind of over uh, overlooked in a lot of these uh, international treaties. So despite the ban, though, Japan, Norway, Iceland, they kill about 1,300 whales of certain species for scientific purposes, like I mentioned before. And uh, that meat is still sold commercially. And as we'll see in the, uh, I guess, not the best of places where that meat is sold. So that's a little overview of our aquatic uh, biodiversity and problems that we have with it. Next, we'll take a look at what we can do to kind of protect it and help it. I hope you enjoyed this screencast. Take care.